Okay, uh, today is January 15th, 2014, and I am Susan West, and I'm here with Mike Kelminski in Rodanthe. Are we well, in Rodanthe? we're actually in Wade's. Okay, I wasn't sure yeah. where the dividing line no, was. Nobody knows exactly where the line is, but uh, there used to be signs up for the three villages here. And the Waves sign was constantly getting stolen. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. What, people would love having yeah. <laughs> that memento to take home. A friend of mine actually came across one in Hawaii. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, I, I, I can understand <laughs> the attraction of that. Um, it's a great name for a town. But it does, uh, yeah, it's referred more is a tri-village area now, more than individual towns. Is that okay with you, or yeah, do you object yeah, no, to I that? Yeah, no, I don't have any problem with it. Because I, I know where I live. <laughs> okay, I've heard some people say, don't call it the tri-villages. They don't like, you know, tri-villages. It did have a funny ring to it, but now it just kind of goes through me, and uh, I accept it. Um, where were you born? I was born in Pasadena, California. 1949. Okay. Huntington Memorial Hospital. And um, most of my siblings were born there, although uh, being in a Navy family, some of my siblings were born overseas. Okay. Um, is that where you grew up? Uh, we, I grew up on, uh, on and around military bases, pretty much. All over the U.S.? Uh, around the U.S., some overseas. Uh, we had tours in Japan and Guam okay. and Newfoundland. Ooh. And uh, it, was, it was kind of a tough way to grow up, making adjustments every few years to new friends and new places. But um, in retrospect, it was, a, I think, it was a rich experience. Um, we're... Where were you when you went to high school? Was that in different locations? Yeah, well, by, by then, uh, my dad's last tour of duty in the Navy was in uh, Washington, D.C. <clears throat> so uh, we lived in Arlington in Northern Virginia from the time, let's see, when I was about in uh, seventh grade up through high school and a couple of years of college. Uh, yeah, I was in uh, Northern Virginia mainly. Okay. And I went to college uh, at George Mason, went a couple of years there. Did you graduate? I did not graduate. Okay. What did you study? I was uh, studying engineering and taking some business courses. And when I had, I was in a chemistry class one day. This is a, a very defining moment in my life was in chemistry class my textbook in front of me and Surfer Magazine inserted in the book. <laughs> and I'm, I'm looking at surfing pictures while my professor's up there lecturing on, uh, you know, molecules. And well, were you surfing at that time? Yes. Uh, what? So I was commuting from Northern Virginia to the beach in Delaware. Okay. Um, yeah, my, my folks had bought a little beach cottage in the uh, late 60s. And uh, yeah, that that was kind of, that was I was interested in surfing, but that got me more interested, and so I I acted and bought a board. And do you remember how much that board cost? Or yeah, I paid ninety bucks. I had a, a nine six Bing. Bing. Yeah. Okay. Um, did anybody in particular teach you how to surf? Well, I had a a, a good friend of mine from high school, uh, Mike Ganger. He. Uh, fairly prolific artist as he, as he turned out, but uh, he, he actually bought the first board that I rode, <clears throat> so we kind of shared this board, Okay. and it was a mail order. He, he mail ordered this board from okay. California, and I remember when it came, and we opened the box up, and they had this glistening, it was a 10-foot day suite, and um, that's what I probably, that was probably my first wave was on that board, and, th and then I bought a used Bing. Okay. So you went to from D.C. area to Delaware to go surfing. Mm -hmm. 
when when you uh, stopped going to college, were you working in the D.C. area? Yeah, I, actually, I was. Uh, people don't know much about my <laughs> interest in automobiles, but I was pretty much a motorhead in high school, and uh, my dad uh, bought Volkswagen. He had these old Volkswagen Beetles because. Uh, as a family, we had quite a few people in our family driving, you know, okay. and because uh, I was one of uh, seven kids, uh -huh. and um, my dad bought these uh, 258 Volkswagens, and uh, my dad was a very hands-on person, never called a repairman, he did all this stuff himself, so he, he and I started, to, you know, he'd be rebuilding motors and tuning them up, and, and I, I jumped right in there, and we, we were a team. Okay. working on these Great. things and that got me uh, uh, into a job where I was involved with cars. I worked at a Mercedes-Benz dealership for a couple of years. Okay. And we sold uh, Mercedes parts and Fiat parts and Studebaker parts. And that's mm -hmm. what I worked in the parts facility end of it. Did you end up moving to Delaware? Yes. Yeah, I could, well, I, I, I could see the futility in living in the D.C., Northern Virginia area. I, I, I came to dislike it, and I think it was embedded in me, moving around uh, the globe a little bit in this military family. Uh, one of our last tours of duty was on Guam, and, then from, and I loved that place, uh, tropical, just gorgeous. And uh, from there, they stationed my dad in D.C. So that was that was quite a shock yes. to me, <laughs> as about a, I was I think I was about 13 years old, and um, so I didn't like that move, and I never did. But I I went to school, I did all these things I was supposed to do, and uh, when I decided I didn't want to finish college, I was you know all too happy to get out of the area and and head to the water and kind of think about what I wanted to do with myself. Okay. So that, that kind of started a prog progression of events. I uh, lived in the Delaware area probably about two years and then was making trips down to the uh, to Hatteras well, to um, surf. Do you remember when you first heard about Hatteras Island? Was that in connection with surfing? If you heard about it from other surfers? Yeah, I, I, it was a combination of things. I had heard about it from other surfers in Delaware, and also there, you know, maybe an article or two in a magazine. Uh, you could look at these pictures and you go, oh, "That looks pretty nice." Of course, the pictures always make the waves look sure. really good. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I came down here on some trips with my friends, and we'd camp out at the uh, Cape Point campground, and uh, you know, walk to the out to the point and go fishing or go to the lighthouse and go surfing. And um, what years basically are we talking? I don't I think my you know one of my first trips down here might have been 67 or 68. Okay. And then I didn't move here actually till 73. And how old would you have been in 73? About 23. Okay. Twenty-four. And, and, and tell me about the decision to move here, and who you came with, or did you come alone? Yeah, I uh, I'd come down on these camping trips, and then of course when it's, when it's time to leave, you know you kind of see how nice it is when you're when you leave the area, you miss it, and you kind of you know subsequent trips the same reaction. I just thought, well. I'm just going to take this step and just load the car up and uh, see what and, happens. And see what happens. And my intent was maybe to get my feet wet, so to speak, for about six months, and and move on from there. So I had no intention of living here permanently. Okay. But the more I, the more I did live here, the less I wanted to leave. It, Why? I think. Um, I think I liked the lifestyle, uh, you know, the isolation, 
And at that time, the, there was a lot of talk among people of my generation, oh, you know, Australia, let's move to Australia. They're about 20 years behind the U.S. or something. Right. And I was finding Cape Hatteras was kind of 20 years behind the U.S., you know, uh -huh. the mainland. It right. Was, uh, people here weren't as caught up in, in the mainstream, and I, and I did like that. Where did you live when you first moved here? I lived in uh, Lovey, Mid Lovey and Valton Midget, had a little cottage in Rodanthe, and two of my friends from Ocean City moved here in the, I guess that would have been the summer of 67. But I came down later in the fall and moved in with them. Okay. And my surfing buddy at the time up in Delaware and Maryland was a guy named Louie Batzler. And um, so Louie and I rented one of the bedrooms in Mike and Mary Jo's rented house. So we, okay. we, we, the four of us lived in this little ramshackle cottage, uh, I guess for about six months or so, and then, uh -huh. and then Louie and I found a, a trailer available for rent in Waves, so we rented that from Luke Midget, and it was uh, inexpensive. I think it was about 150 bucks, and we, so we split that two ways, and uh, Louie was a brick mason. By trade, and um, so that's how we made our money. Uh, I would mix his mortar, and he would lay the block or the brick, and uh, we worked when we needed the money. <laughs> the rest of the time, we looked for waves. Wow, I had no idea there was a brick mason on yeah. that or something yeah. at one time. So, I mean, some of the cemeteries in the villages here uh, with. Uh, cinder block walls around them, we, we built them. Okay. Not all of them, but you know, some of okay. them. And so once the locals knew about Louie's skill as a mason, uh, you know, some of the families were calling him and said, oh, can you put this wall around our family plot? And, sure. Okay. So how, how long were you in the um, wall building business with Louie, would you say? I don't know, a couple of years. Um, and of course, being self-employed is a little difficult. To, you know, you've got to discipline yourself. So uh, we uh, we got jobs with a building contractor, John Luke. He he lived in Salvo, and he had a crew. Okay. And um, we started working with him. Oh, I don't know. That might have gone for another two years, maybe. But uh, that crew had some of the local boys on it, uh, Jimmy Hooper and Larry Midget and a few okay. others. And uh, that kind of got me mixed in with the, the locals a little bit. Because it was coming here from the outside, it was a little difficult to uh, get accepted. I was going to ask you about that, like if the, the village embraced you immediately or... Um, I, I, were you invited to like family gatherings and social events? Somewhat. Or, yeah, or were yeah, they I, I, I think, yeah, we, a little cautious? We were embraced, but I was cautious. And, and the local people that were about my age, they were pretty wild. You know, uh huh. Uh, drinking and sucker punching. And, you know, so I, I kind of kept my distance. Right. And I could see. You know, I could look into some of these guys' eyes and they were lit up and I could just say, well, it's my time to go home and uh -huh. go to bed or something. And so I, I, I avoided a lot of controversy that way. Um, what did you do for income then after you finished um, working with Bluey and with the Blue Construction? Um... I kind of jumped around, did odd jobs. Uh, Johnny Hooper in Salvo, I helped him a little bit. His dad, Burgess Hooper, I, you know, helped him a little bit. They have a, you know, pretty good sized tract of land in Salvo with rental cottages on it, and okay. you know, so we were involved with uh, maintaining them and even building a few new buildings. So that that kind of sucked me more into the you know the the local arms, so to speak. And how about as far as surfing and going out in the water, uh, was it, was there 
integration between folks like you who had moved here and the local surfers, or was there some tension there? No, they, no, they, no, it was perfectly integrated. Um, you know, the, and the locals just they had just this crazy style of surfing. You know, I was a bit cautious. I mean, when I got on a wave, I wanted to make it. But the locals here would just, I mean, they take off on these huge closeouts and uh -huh. just get trashed. And they, they kind of had a different um, way of approaching it. But um, I was, you know, photography was my hobby in high school. And I was kind of getting more into that. Um, you know, I, I saw this environment here and it really inspired me to... Well, to yeah. get into it more. I wanted to ask you about how you got into photography, uh, you know. So it was a hobby in high school. Um, when you moved here, did you bring a camera? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a, an old Canon Flex uh -huh. that my dad bought probably back in the 50s. Um, so, I, you know, I was using that. My dad wasn't taking pictures much anymore, so it's, but he let me use the camera. And, uh, so what did you do with the film? Well, I'd, I shoot, mean, I'd shoot slides and uh, send it off uh, to get developed, and it would, I remember waiting for it to come back, and I'm always excited to, to look at it as almost like a kid in a candy store scenario. You know, you put these things up to a light and look at the, you know, the colors and, and the composition. Um, but I, yeah, once I lived here, uh, the place was starting to eat me up as far as the inspiration and uh, okay. you know my photography just kind of snowballed gradually. Do you remember uh, the first time you sold some of your art? Yeah, uh, probably through uh, some friends would, you know, I mean I, I did slideshows um, Sometimes, Where did you do slideshows? Um, either at people's homes. Uh, one time I did a, a slide presentation at the community building um, for the uh, some of the, a local homemakers extension group, okay. and uh, they really enjoyed it. And of course, the lights were off while, as, as I'm doing this, and I'm flipping slides up, and then I ended the, the show with a nice sunset, uh -huh. and. Uh, Lo and behold, these people have been passing a hat and putting money in it for me. I don't remember how much it was, wow. but it was, you know, it was greatly appreciated, and and I, and I saw how people appreciated what I was doing, and it kind of gave me more incentive to keep going. Sure. Yeah, that's great encouragement. So, so, yeah, it is. It is. Um, and then I did a. Uh, did a little show up at the aquarium. My, my girlfriend at the time was an intern up there in the summer, so I got to know the aquarium staff, and they invited me to do a little exhibit, which ended up staying for about 10 years. So a lot of people wow. saw it, and um, I think I had 28 pictures in that, in that show, and with a little biographical information about myself, and um, so people, people would read it, and then they started coming down here looking for me. Okay. No, and, 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 and about that same time, I opened a shop in my house. By then, I, I was renting a house in Rodanthe. I probably moved in there probably in the, I don't know, 77 or so. Okay. And I was in that house for about 10 years, and the front room I converted into a gallery space with track lighting. Put a sign out front. And, uh, so, so that was probably a point where you made a conscious decision and investment that you know photography is an important part of who I am, yes. and you know it'd be nice if I could you know support myself yes. <laughs> through that. And, and, and by that time, there was a little bit of money coming in from print sales, and. Um, the rest of the, you know, the odd jobs and things that I was depending on so much, uh, they were moving on. I, I wasn't doing many things like construction jobs. So talk a little bit about your subject matter. Um, I mean, looking around the gallery here, I see 
it's sort of mixed. I mean, you mentioned, you know, nature, but also I see buildings, I see boats. So did you start off primarily focusing on a particular subject? Uh, was there anything in the early years that you gravitated? I would say landscapes. You know, I came here I and mean, I saw these two beautiful beaches and, you know, and kind of getting back to my dad a little bit, he, he was a meteorologist in the Navy. Oh. And then when he retired from the Navy, he did, he did meteorology through NOAA. Okay. Um, so I always had that fascination for weather. Okay. And I loved the storms, you know, the storms that I would see here. Okay. Um, my first Christmas, I, I stayed here by myself, and there was, we had a really a big storm, and I remember sitting on the, the porch of this little cottage that the four of us were renting, and uh, I could see the, the, the tops of the waves and the spray over the tops of the dunes one day. And wow. You know, the, the sky was dark, and you could hear the, you know, the... The, the noise of the, the pounding waves, and you could actually even feel it. You know, it was vibrating right. the, the, the sand. But um, that, that was a, that was also a defining moment for me. I just uh, thought eh, this is pretty pretty inspirational. So uh, you know, I had a lot to learn about photography. You know, exposures and composition, and I just kind of learned on my own and made mistakes and tried to improve myself. So. You're self-taught then. Have you Pretty ever ha had like formal training? I, I've gone to s several workshops okay. over the years. Um, and where were they? In, um, different in the early 80s I went up to Maine. I think it was in 82. I went to Maine photographic workshops. I studied under a, uh, an Austrian photographer named Ernst Haas. Very well-known photographer. Um, did a lot of stuff for life and Newsweek and all these other big European magazines, um, but he, yeah, he was uh, a great inspiration to me. And so that you know that that class was about a week long, and I remember coming back from that and assimilating all this information for years beyond that. You know, in fact, I still think about that class and and, and the instruction and um, you know the just the uh, Ernst Haas attitude towards taking pictures. He, he had a, an uncanny uh, eye for, for color and, and design. And he could just take a what you would normally think was a simple scene and you look at the picture and it's just this remarkable impact out of it. And then uh, shortly after that I went to Carmel, California and I uh, studied under several photographers there for a few weeks. Um, through a group called Friends of Photography, oh. and uh, one of the instructors uh, was uh, an assistant to Ansel Adams, a guy named uh, Ted Orland, okay. um, and a few other guys. Uh, Edward Weston was a famous photographer. His his son was there doing a class. Uh, his name was Cole Weston, okay. and I, I did a few hours with him. Um, and that was about the time I wanted to shoot with this large format camera because that's what people out there were doing. It was okay. very, very artistic and high quality. So I, I bought that kit in uh, 1979, uh, kind of trying to get into that that genre of. Uh, Did you say that was mail order? You bought it. And you yeah, I, s I saw that. The and you had to assemble it yourself. Yeah, it was a kit that was uh, for sale in a magazine. Uh -huh. It was a, a magazine ad. Um, the guy was an architect up in uh, Michigan, I think, and he was made, he designed this simple plywood camera and came to you in parts and you assembled it. And I still have it now. And, and he said it it worked well, but it was bulky. Very bulky. Di difficult to use. You couldn't if if it, if it was windy outside, you couldn't shoot with it. Oh. Okay, that's a problem around yeah, here. Yeah, around here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But so. eventually I kind of compromised. I went to what they call a medium format. And um, 
I bought a, a medium format system in the early 90s, and um, that 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 gave you the mo sort of the mobility of 35 millimeter, but kind of approaching the quality of large format. So it was a nice compromise, and I still have that camera. Okay. And I've, uh, I've Do used you use it. it? I've, 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 I shot with it about two years ago. Okay. What? Sort of, ca do you use a digital camera now? I'm using digital cameras mainly now, uh -huh. yes. And do you like those? Or tell me about, you know, technology changes um, in the equipment that you've used, and were you resistant to digital cameras at I, first? I, I was at first. Um, around the year 2000, I bought a scanner and an inkjet printer. And I started scanning some of my slides, and I'd been printing my uh, hand printing my color in black and white for years and years, all self-taught. Hand printing? Uh, yeah, in a dark room with chemicals. Okay. Um, and that was that was uh, pretty much the bulk of my livelihood was making prints. So in the summertime, when my business was going full on, I was in my dark room all the time and. I had a sign on my door, you know, people walking into my gallery, they don't see anybody. Right. And I just had a little sign there, just pound on the wall and I'll come out of the dark room. <laughs> uh -huh. But by uh, the year 2000 or so, I was kind of getting sick of working in the dark room. It was very mechanical and tedious um, and time consuming. So when I made the switch to scanning and inkjet printing, I thought it was quite a miracle. And it was very timely for me because I was getting tired of the old way of doing okay. it. But uh, in 2003 I bought my first digital camera and um, and that yeah that was that was quite an eye-opener. And by, and by 2003 uh, I think the, the by then I was convinced the quality was up to snuff uh, to film okay. if, if not surpassing it. And of course by now you know 2014 now it's uh, yeah it has surpassed it. In your subject matter, has it? Have, can you see that it's changed through the years? Or, or you <coughs> yes. In what um, way? Well, I don't know. I, I kind of bounce around with subject matter. Uh, I, I like the uh, the commercial fishing in the area. So uh, you know, some of the the locals here, I've gone out fishing and photographing them and. Um, I've always liked that. I've got quite a nice collection of uh, images, um, so I, I, I've kind of always kept that in my mix. But then, uh, one of my other side jobs, I was I did some hunting guide work out at Gull Island Gunning Club. And where is Gull Island? Gull Island is uh, southwest of Salvo, okay. maybe maybe about five miles, <coughs> and I worked for. Uh, had a little kind of a part-time job with Alex Coderitas, um, and that that, pro that that job was probably my last uh, construction endeavor because he he built a, a big house in Salvo. Well, back then it was considered big. It was about a 3,500 square foot building, and um, he hired a crew. He had a, had a, had it architecturally designed. Was he the gentleman with Mary Jane yes, Bakery? Yes, that's right. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I got hooked up with him because I was renting a trailer in Salvo from Raymond Midget and his wife. And Raymond was a hunting guide, and he worked with uh, uh, Bert Hooper out there. And Bert Hooper's dad was a guide out there before him. Uh, his name was Ed Hooper. Okay. I don't, I don't remember meeting him. But I certainly, uh, you know, knew Bert and Raymond quite well, and um, they were always getting in arguments with Alex. <laughs> and so, you know, Alex would repeatedly fire these guys, <laughs> and then he then he he'd ask them to come back, uh -huh. and it was just kind of crazy. But you know, I was kind of standing by, and he was paying me four bucks an hour uh, cash in an envelope he'd bring down, uh -huh. and. Um, so it kind of worked out for me. I, I, I stuck with that. I did the hunting guide work for probably about five years. So, uh, what, who came? What were the what? Describe the clientele. He would he would bring uh, bakery clients. 
Okay. Um, gosh, you could talk to Bert Hooper at some point. I don't know if you have, but he, he would he would be a wealth of information okay. about about those guys. A lot of their names I can't remember. Okay. But there was a, a, a three guys from Tennessee. They were involved politically in the in the Tennessee government, and uh, <clears throat> God, they were a wild, crazy bunch. <laughs> um, and, and, and I wasn't that skilled in hunting, but I was, you know, a guide, and I was expected to take a, a gun and shoot cripples that they, uh -huh. were, that they would shoot. And I had I just had a hard time doing that because I did I I like birds, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> but. I, but I saw a lot of birds out there, and, um, okay. and so uh, what kind of birds did did you shoot? Uh, mostly redheads. Okay. There were huge flocks of redheads. Of course, the redhead flocks like deeper water generally, okay. and they're a diving duck. So we did a lot of them, and uh, just I don't know a little bit of everything. It's just a fantastic area, um, very prolific is a, a feeding ground and it's right at the edge of the reef okay. where the water you know just is shallow and then it drops off but it's uh, yeah it's just a, a fascinating place out there and I, I feel privileged to have been able to spend many days and nights uh, just seeing the uh, did the you ever do any hunting by yourself? Or you know, I did. I, I, I got my hunting license. Uh, you know, of course, I used to go out with Robin a lot, uh -huh. and um, Robin Gerald, and see him hunting. So one, one winter, I got my hunting license, and I was going to go out and shoot some snow geese out back, and I, I just couldn't do it, uh -huh. you know? So that was the end of my hunting career. <laughs> I did have a, to work at Gull Island, I had a guide's license. Uh, to work out there. You know, I used to go down to Charles Williams' store and get that. And then I had to maintain all the decoys and take them out there and tie weights on them and lines and set the blinds up. Well, when you first moved here, um, were there stores that sold produce and meats? Uh, Dan Leary had a store in Salvo. And that was about it here. It was. It was uh, just kind of a, a local general store type of a place. So, so did you go to Avon to Charles Williams <coughs> store? Did yeah, that that was a little more stocked. That was more like a grocery store, okay. <coughs> and they they had a lot of hardware and you know good uh, meat department and some produce. But yeah, back then, uh, yeah, grocery shopping here was completely different than it is now. Um, talking about food and other outdoor activities, tell me a little something about oyster farming and how you got into that and you know what it entails. Well, my my interest in commercial fishing, uh, you know. I, Did I, you ever commercial fish? A little bit. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, in fact, Alex Cotaritas, he had he had some boats and some nets. And uh, he said, uh, you know, here, go fishing. And I remember it was, in, I don't remember the year exactly, I'd have to look it up, but uh, it would have been in the s late 70s. But uh, we probably had about 3,000 yards of kill net. And uh, we had probably three boats that we had a pick of. And <clears throat> we usually fished out of this one boat. Uh, it was a Willie Austin built boat. But, but Willie Austin from Avon. From Avon. Okay. I think it was about a 24-footer with a tunnel drive and a uh, four-cylinder Wisconsin air-cooled in it. And who, when you say we, who was well, we? Well, uh, my roommate at the time, his name was uh, B.J. Huff, Brian Huff. Okay. And uh, he moved here from Michigan, and we got to be very good friends. And, uh, yeah, was we, he a surfer? No, he didn't surf, okay. but, he, but he loved sport fishing. Okay. He would fish on the pier, getting these big drones okay. and stuff. And so we were, yeah, we fished these nets together for a few months. And, uh, you know, of course the locals were telling us how to do it and, and all this, but we were we were doing what we thought we should do, and we, we set half of them in shallow water and half in deep water. 
And it was amazing because we were out catching the locals by far. We'd go, you know, take our catch up to the Redanthe uh, fish house. And, uh, that used to be at the, at the creek, uh, yeah. At the harbor. That's right. Okay. And there were a couple of active fish houses up there at the time. Oh, there was more than one? Uh, well, mainly one, but there was a, yeah, mainly okay. one was where you would sell to. Okay. And do you remember the name of that or, or, or who ran well, that? Well, Dale, Dale Midget was, uh, Dale he Midget. was buying the fish, okay. I think, for uh, Jimmy Austin. Okay. <clears throat> and what were you catching? A variety. Trout, blues, flounder. Okay. We had a nice big red drum one time that we snuck in. Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, the, one of the caretakers at Alex's was a guy named Charlie Swindell, an old crotchety guy. And um, he said, well, when you guys get, get the first drum, I want it. <clears throat> so BJ and I, we caught this, it's probably a, I don't know, 35, 40 pound drum. <clears throat> and... Uh, we put this thing up under the forepeak and we snuck it in and, uh, you know, Charlie caught, he sees us pull the boat up and we didn't tell him about it. And we, so we took the drum home and cleaned it and ate it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he never knew any different. <laughs> so, so you did some commercial fishing, so, I, you know, so. Oh, you're getting to the yeah, oyster. stream. Oyster. Okay. So, uh. About in '82, there, I, I went up. I entered a uh, waterfowl festival up in Easton, Maryland. And I With took, your photographs. Yes, I took okay. my all, I took a bunch of my waterfowl pictures up there to display. Very poor sales, um, so I spent a lot of time talking to people and stuff. And anyway, I ran into a friend of mine who was who was coming through, and. Uh, he was working on the skipjack at the time. He said, hey, Mike, after the show, you know, hang around and go out, on, go out on the boat on Monday. So I went out on the skipjack, called the Stanley Norman the following Monday. And did that go out of Easton? Or yeah, it went out of Tillman Island, which okay. was nearby. Okay. Um, it wasn't a particularly dramatic day, you know, as far as sailing, but a, I, I liked the wooden boats and the canvas and the sailing was a very exhilarating. But, but the, were you going out to Oyster, or was well, I was I was taking pictures. Okay. okay. And just as, ob observing. Okay. So I kind of once I got that under my belt, uh, I went home the next day, and a few weeks later, uh, my friend Trent that had turned me on to this, he called me and said, "There's a couple of boats up here with openings." Uh, you know, come up and, you know, you can get a job if you want. So I ended up going up, uh, I think it was uh, December of 82, 83. But um, I hooked up with this boat called uh, Virginia W. That had just been rebuilt. It was uh, 1904, originally built um, up in uh, Virginia somewhere on the western shore. Um, and was that boat sailing out of Tillman? It was sailing out of Tillman Island. Okay. It was one of the smaller skipjacks, probably around 40 feet. Okay. And, uh, but they just had these huge masts and booms on them. It carried a tremendous amount of sail. But, uh, you know, I stepped on board this mor that morning. You know, it was well before sun up. And um, I met just a fantastic group of people. You know, the, the, especially the, the, the owner of the boat was the captain, okay. Tim Stearns. And um, I ended up working on that boat for two winters. And uh, you got to be very good friends with, uh, with Tim and a few of the crew members. Tell me about working on an oyster boat. Well, it was uh, long, long hours. Of course, you, you know, the oystering uh, is done between sunrise, sunrise and sundown. So you want to be out on the oystering <coughs> grounds when the sun comes up. So that would mean you'd have to leave the dock well before that. So <coughs> yeah, early mornings, uh, sometimes just brutal cold. Um, and as long as you had, you're wearing the proper gear, you were okay. Uh -huh. uh, insulated boots, 
insulated gloves. It had these uh, insulated gloves with these rubber <coughs> gloves called blackjacks over top of them and a calling hammer and you throw the dredge over on command, pull the dredge and then you wind the dredges in, call through what you've caught and uh, you know keep the good oysters and throw the rest back overboard. So it was uh, very physical yeah. and, and cold and uh, I, I, I wouldn't want to be doing it now. But okay. I was, I, mean, I was probably, I was in my early 30s at the time, and you know, had the uh, wherewithal to, to get it done. And I kept a camera by my side, and I'd snap a shot every now and then. Okay. But uh, yeah, that ended after uh, I, I, the last day I went out. The bay had frozen, and the water, the the ice was about a foot thick. <coughs> and we were out in open water, and when it was time to come in, we couldn't get back in. There were several other skipjacks out at the time as well, and uh, the state sent in an icebreaker oh. so we could get back into uh, port. Okay. And uh, that was my last experience on the skipjack. I haven't been up there since, but I've, I've thought about going to hook up with some people and see how many boats are left. Right. And, but they're continually going by the wayside. It's uh, kind of a thing that's, you know, just like the fishing culture is kind of sure. dissipating. I think several of those skipjacks are in um, a Mariner's Museum in St. Michael's. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. And then the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, they own a few. The boat that I worked on, uh, last I heard a, a couple of years ago, was uh, in the water in a, a little town in Virginia called Kinsale, Virginia. It's on the western shore of the bay. Um, in not very good shape. Some some guy had bought it and had been restoring it, but wooden boats you have to keep constantly on them. And uh, it didn't. The picture I saw of it sitting in the water didn't look really very very good. But um, so you never did any oystering out of North Carolina. Not really commercially, no. Okay. But. Um, I did get a fascination for oystering because on the Chesapeake Bay they're only growing in certain areas and up there you would have a depth sounder and you're looking for these, uh, you know, you're going across a, a level bottom and then when you come across a lump the oysters are usually growing on those lumps because they're elevated somewhat off the, okay. the normal bottom where they can get more nutrients. Okay. Um, but that always fascinated me how they grew in certain areas and of course down here I would go out looking for oysters for my own personal use and I was fascinated by the fact that they grew here and not there you know right. so I I, was, I started uh, gathering some from other places uh, and putting them behind my house here where I've got sound front and uh, thinking that I could just put them in the water and everything would be okay but it really wasn't the case. Uh, I had a lot of uh, mortality um, in the summertime. The algae would, would choke them and kill them. Okay. But uh, but did you get any harvest out of those? I mean, oh, well, not initially. Okay. But I went to an oyster conference in Moorhead City. I think it was in 2004, and I hooked up with other people of like-minded interest. Um, Mainly a fellow named Skip Kemp that was uh, teaching. Uh, well, he was he was a, a shellfish specialist with uh, Sea Grant okay. for years, and then he uh, he got away from Sea Grant and got into uh, teaching aquaculture at Carteret Community College in okay. Moorhead. And he was at this conference, and I had heard about him, but uh, I was drawn to him right away, and. Um, he kind of mentored me in my oyster gardening, and about that time he he started a class uh, to get people interested in oyster gardening. Okay. And I went to that. I think it was in Bellhaven or somewhere. He 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 got a group together and showed them how to measure uh, you know the turbidity with a Seppi disc that you drop down in the water, and you can you can see how clear the water is. Um, you know, taking water quality information, temperature, salinity. So I, I got more interested in those things. And um, of course, he was raising them in, in a lab 
down at the community college. So he w he asked me if I would get him some brood stock up here. So I had a, a couple of spots where I, I like to go to pick oysters, and I picked out some of the biggest, best ones I could find. And um, generally, the ones that the, the great big brooders that are still that have been living for a long time, they have resistance to disease and parasites. So genetically, that's what you want. So I was taking him. I took him a couple of batches, and uh, so he's spawning them in the lab. And he gave me uh, 40,000 eyed larvae from this hatch that he did. Okay. Um, that he, sounds like a lot to me. Well, I don't it, know. It is does. it? <laughs> 40,000 uh, of anything is at the, a at, lot. At the same time, he was working with Nature Conservancy, and I was kind of helping the Nature Conservancy guys out. They were working out of uh, uh, the harbor at Ronchi's, okay. and they set up a, a place where they were going to. Uh, set uh, do a remote setting with these la eyed larvae. Um, what does but, that but, mean, a remote setting? Um, well, the eyed larvae they they look pretty much like grains of sand. Okay. But but the remote setting is a replication of nature. You put seawater in a tank with an air pump, and then you throw shell in there. And then you dump the eyed larva in. They're 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 living, okay. and they swim around for a few days, and they attach to the shells in the tank. So in three days, uh, you can take the shells out, and this uh, you know I documented this with pictures. Uh, this picture right here, these these specks on that shell, they're all one day old oysters. So I I, I had a very successful remote setting. I probably. I don't know how many made it, but I figured maybe half of them did. Okay. So once they started to grow, it's a week. Um, once they started to grow, um, I, I was beginning to nurture them and, and, and learn about their habitat and survival. What do you mean nurture them? What do well, I, I go out there and I, I, I nurture it just like you would a garden. I, I have a clam rake and uh, the, 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 the shell that's on the bottom, I kind of... Uh, move it around to get the sediment off. Sedimentation behind the house, we have, there's a lot of wave action and sedimentation. Okay. So that would smother them? Absolutely. Okay. And that was, I had a few stumbling blocks initially, but once I was uh, learning the ins and outs from Skip Kemp, um, in fact, he even told me once I was having algae problems and they were, they were smothering some of these oysters and killing them. And he said, well, you know, mix up a real heavy salt brine with the rock salt and dip these oysters, the algae-covered oysters, stick, stick them in the salt, in the salt water, and then put them out in the, uh, in the air to air dry them. And if, and if summer day, that's when you would have algae blooms in the heat. So I'd set them out on a table and dry them out. You're desiccating the, the algae. Okay. And, um, you know... In a matter of hours, they were just pristine, clean again. Amazing. Amazing. So then I could put them back. But I did learn that I needed, for optimum growth, I needed to elevate these up off the bottom for you know their longest survival. So I started doing that. And, and is that for circulation or <clears throat> well, they get, Yeah, they, they get better uh, nutrient flow that way. Okay. And they're, they, fa they grow faster. Um, if you grow oysters on the bottom, they grow slower. And if you, well, the, the state you can lease bottom from the state, but you can also lease water column. So the guys that are growing oysters in the water column are getting a, a three-inch oyster in a year. Okay. So, so how do you elevate them? What do you do? Well, I guess you, you'd have some kind of a system where you're hanging them in, in cages or floating. Floating okay. cages, um, and then of course you have to. Uh, if you have algae problems, you can lift these things out and, and dry them out. But uh, you know, then little little crabs and critters, all kinds of stuff is intermingling in there with them, and some of it good for the oyster, some of it not so good. Right. So, so the property where you do this is that leased 
Do you lease? No, that? I, I looked into a lease, and uh -huh. the marine fisheries uh, representative came out and um, kind of discouraged me. He said, "Well, you know, if you if you lease this, it's it's going to cost money. You have to have a survey done." So I figured I'd be spending at least a few thousand dollars um, just just to get going. Right. And he said, with the, with the wave action back here and the, and the sedimentation, uh, it's I guess you could call it kind of a hard bottom or a, or a white bottom, sandy bottom out here, and it's like that because of all the sand suspended in the waters oh. washing in and, and, okay. and dropping. But uh, th you know, I saw that firsthand when I'd go out and I'd have to, you know, rake these things around with my oyster rake or my clam rake and kind of shake the, the sand off of them. So what I did, I, I <coughs> my neighbor was uh, smashing his crab pots to get rid of them. They were uh -huh. all used. So I started grabbing some of those old smashed, flattened crab pots, and I'd make a little mat out there on the bottom. I'd just set them out there, and I started oh. placing the oysters on top of those okay. mats, and uh, it made all the difference. Okay, interesting. So, so, tell me a little bit what happened with, let's say, Hurricane Irene. Irene, yeah, Irene. I was concerned because we we had a twelve foot or a ten foot uh, surge from the Pamlico Sand, yeah. and uh, of course we we were up to our necks here and um, you know just cleaning up and right. fixing damage and all that. So I, I didn't get back there for probably three weeks after the storm, and I and I was thinking, gosh, you know, it's not going to be much left, but. Uh, you know, I went back there and it was like nothing ever happened because really? there was, you know, 10, 12 feet of water over top. Of, well, they're, they're generally in two feet of water, so there was 12, 13 feet of water. That's the turbulence was well above them, so they were they were fine. So is this, the oyster gardening, is that a hobby with you or is that... Yeah. Yeah, it's a hobby. It's uh, and it's become part of a photographic subject. I've, uh -huh. I've enjoyed documenting it. The uh, e of course, each oyster shell is individual, like a human fingerprint. Uh -huh. uh, there's no two that are exactly alike. But uh, I've gotten fascinated with the patterns and the colors on them, and I've uh, done some close-up photography. Uh, so I, you know, it's, it's been, uh, been a bit profitable in that regard. Do they taste good? Yeah. Uh -huh. And the, when the water's cold, they they get much better. Uh huh. And um, I won't. Uh, I generally won't mess with them uh, after rain falls. And of course, after Irene, I didn't eat an oyster back there for probably a year. Uh huh. And it is it is kind of uh, near a storm drain too. So uh, okay. I did some another little offshoot. Uh, did some work with the. Coastal Federation on water quality and uh, Jan De Blue was kind of uh, orchestrating it uh, locally and uh, there were several of us that had uh, areas near storm drains and about usually within 15 or 20 minutes after an intense rain you go out there to get the flush coming out of the, the storm drain so we were getting water samples and sending them uh, for analysis uh, for coliform, okay. and uh, yeah, it was, it was amazing uh, the bacteria that was coming out of that pipe. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. It would be uh, double and triple, you know, past the uh, you know the safe wow. level. Wow. Yeah, that's surprising. And do you think that that might be because of septic systems? Yes. I mean, we don't yeah. have yeah, it would be industry pr pr primarily from development. All these uh -huh. houses here are on their own septic systems. Right. Um, of course, coliform can be detected from uh, animal uh -huh. waste. Wild animals. But uh, considering the uh, yeah you know, the elevated levels of the coliform. Um, it's it's hard to say, but I would you know it, it, septic systems would have to be the main culprit here. Do you know if there are other people on Hatteras Island doing any oyster farming, um, gardening? They have a, a, a down at the Cape Hatteras School, the Coastal Studies Institute. They they've gotten some something going down there. In fact, I was supplying them 
with broodstock uh, for their oyster project. They were they were um, spawning them in the lab, okay. and evidently at one point they spawned a lot of mine and got it was very successful. But at some point they something happened and most of them died. Okay. But uh, the, they've uh, evidently built quite a nice reef down there behind the school. Um. You had mentioned earlier that when you first moved here, it was just probably going to be a stop along the way to other places. Um, and you mentioned, uh, you know, the appeal of um, the area after uh, living in Washington. Do you still feel that same way? About Hadrosalva? Um, somewhat. Um, Are there things I, I, about I, it that annoy you now? Well, yeah, it's you know it's it's kind of crowded in the summer, um, but that's a double-edged sword too because I'm depending on these people to come in here and and help my livelihood, and they do. Um, but I don't know. I, yeah, I've been here a little over forty years now, and. Um, I'm starting to think about looking elsewhere. I mean, I don't know where to, where it would go, but maybe I'll travel a little bit. And are there other things about changes here or the current issues <clears throat> that would uh, make you more inclined to think about being off the island more often? Well, I mean, there's, it, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the kiteboarding has exploded, uh, along with a few other things. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, you know, and, and, and a lot of that, there's noise issues. Uh, they've got these big uh, tournaments and stuff right. and live music, and, and that's almost next door to me right now. Uh -huh. That's, you know, not, in my mind, not good for my neighborhood, but, uh, right. you know, we kind of like, have accepted it. but. Um, no, yeah, it's it's not like it used to be, and um, but I, you know, it's all you have to do is go traveling around, and you can. That, that's when you start to miss this place too. So it's yeah, it's kind of a delicate thing to to talk about. Um, yeah, it is. And I, and you know, I'm getting up there in years, and I try to go out and do my exercise and walk and stuff. Um, if I, and I'm thinking, if I could just live on a tropical island that had perfect waves coming in, for an old man like me, I could stay in good shape till I'm 100. And, and, and I kind of fantasize about going somewhere where I can do that. Uh -huh. Everything, my whole life is right here in this house. So yeah. how do you just pick this up and go somewhere? And, and I, couldn't, I couldn't do this livelihood anywhere else but here. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it would it'd be very difficult to move everything mm -hmm. <laughs> to another place. Yeah. Well, I think you know that's about it as far as some questions I had jotted down. Um, do you have anything else you'd like to share for the record? No. Um, you know, I think when I moved here, there were a lot of other like-minded people. Uh, there was an influx of. Uh, surfers from Florida that came up about that time and most of the uh, uh, the people, the outsiders that were coming here were um, you know surfing type people. Um, most of the, the Florida contingent, or actually most of them in general were going to the Buxton area where the jetty was because that was that was where the wave right. was. And um, for some reason, yeah, I just gravitated to the, uh, you know, Rodanthe Wave Salvo area because it was, you know, people would have to go through here to get to Buxton, but very few of them were stopping here. Right. So there was just a handful of uh, outside surfers that, that came to the villages, um, and we, we probably outnumbered the, uh, you know, the local surfers. Can you imagine how people who move here now 
what their perception of the island or the attraction is. I, I try to do that and I have a hard time. They're, they're probably as excited as I was in 1973. Uh-huh. Because, you, know? uh, you, know, you know, if you're young and, uh, you know, into surfing and kiting and fishing, yeah, and, uh, yeah it's... It's still a pretty, pretty nice place, yeah. you know, if you keep, keep that in perspective. It is. Well, thanks, Mike. Okay, Susan. Appreciate it. Enjoyed it. Come back again. I will. <laughs>